Hallo, ja. Yeah. Så sker der noget. Awesome, and uh, thank you for uh, joining me here for the first uh, presentation of this Born hack. So I'll, um, I'll try to give a little uh, sort of look into the badges that we've been doing for the past five years in, in, uh, here at Born hack and uh, going a little deeper on this year's badge, uh, what's on it, uh, some of the production stuff of what happened and, and uh, the little nitty gritty nerdy things. So uh, first, um, yeah, go go through all the little history of batches we have here. We have sort of a mini sort of a anniversary with the fifth edition of Bornhack, and uh, then um, look into some of the ideas and the plans for the batch of this year, and then what actually ended up being in the batch for this year, uh, and then uh, close up with uh, a look at at how batches like these uh, are made. Um, also, uh, yeah, due to, to the how it ended up being made, uh, there's a little more information that you normally would get in uh, in production. So the, the mini history, um, most of the batches we have had has been sort of focused on being relatively simple, so that most people, if they sort of wanted to figure out and, and sort of understand how the batch works. They could go in and look at it and, and it wouldn't be like too complicated it would be simple things connected to each other um, and, and 
try to put it in sort of in a way where, where, where it could be um, understood and, and sort of fairly deep uh, because many of these electronics things they are um, for some they are just a black box and, and and there's something you use you put some software in and something comes out um, but but on the level of these batches you can actually go in and, and, and actually figure out the whole thing and uh, how, how stuff is, is, is on the little nitty-gritty things on little registers and, and so on that, that that's that's possible on, on many of these and not an undoable fee, uh, a task another thing is that these batches shouldn't be too expensive uh, we are still sort of a smaller hacker camp uh, we need sponsors to, to, to pay for some of these things um, and we don't have like an unlimited budget to, to, to play with uh, so trying to sort of keep them within a reason um, so we don't spend like all the ticket money on just a batch we can also need like toilets and all the other things and speakers tent and so on uh, so it need to be manageable in, in, in price um, and, and one of the things that we've been using especially for the past uh, this year and the past three years uh, where sort of we can write software on the batch um, we've been sort of inspired by the demo scene thing where we have like a limited set of resources you have like 8k or 128k or whatever sort of limited stuff you can put in and there's like a border you, you can't expand that it's, it's, it's what's there uh, and then do the best we can with that uh, that's been sort of one of the ideas and having these fairly small processes fairly small mic control they're still 32 bit and so on but they're still in the small range we are measuring normally missing flash in kilobytes and so on, not in megabytes. Um, so the first batch of Pornhack was very simple. It was, um, there, was there was no mic controller on there. There was just a used battery and then a few uh, normal electronic components. Uh, it's, also, it's a little circuit known as Dual Thief where you can boost the voltage of a use AA battery that's usually on the 0 0.8 volts uh, maybe 0 0.5 if it's really used uh, you can boost that voltage up enough to light up a little LED you can use it as a flashlight in your tent or even um, that was sort of the first batch it was very cheap to make it was very quick to make because I had made similar circuit before um, so it was actually sort of a surprise thing nobody actually knew there would be a batch except for me and a few others um, so that was a sort of fun thing there. Uh, it was mostly a soldering exercise. People had to solder it themselves. Um, it's fairly easy, but if you're not used to it, and don't, it, it's it's a, a little sort of new experience uh, in that area. Um, there was some sort of prototyping area on the batch, and but only like I think a, a few, maybe one or two people actually sort of took advantage of that. Um, it looked like this. Um, we used the. Uh, logo from uh, with a uh, Bornholm Island uh, as the main feature on it and then uh, there was a little LED that could, you could, you could point in different directions and it could either be on your name or something so it also had the name tag feature uh, on the batch um, even the little uh, coil you had to wind that yourself so it was like a really DIY project for the uh, 2017 batch um, we went to a microcontroller based platform it's the same that we've been using for a few years now um, one of the main features we put on, on this one was that Esmil he wrote a awesome bootloader that made programming this batch much easier than many other electronics uh, you didn't need to programming so extra programming circuit to do it um, it was just a USB plug-in shows up mass storage write your files uh, down to there and then you, you go going uh, and had new firmware on it uh, we had a little LED, uh, OLED LED screen on it, uh, and the the production of this batch was uh, the sweatshop style in Labitad. We thought, yeah, we can make 100 and 200 ish batches. Uh, we can do that by ourselves. Um, time was a little limited. Um, we, we tried it, and um, we also succeeded. Everybody got a batch, um, but um, it's a lot of work, and when you haven't done this before. It takes some practice to put the stencil correctly, and when it gets smudged, uh, you have to fix stuff afterwards. Um, this is how the batch looked. It had a little uh, 128 by 64, I think, OLED screen. Had uh, two buttons, uh, for four buttons for navigation. Somebody wrote a little snake game, I think. Uh, there was uh, some star field uh, animation stuff. Uh, 
There was some physics animation where there's a, a, a dual pendulum stuff. So people managed to go in and hack that and, and, and write some uh, code on it. Uh, this was all C-based, um, but uh, it was fun to see people actually digging in. And, and the, the, the software angle is a sort of, I think many people here will, will have uh, somewhat ease of getting into that. So for 2018, we need to do more and other things. So this was uh, had a focus on the uh, radio communication. We looked at the BBC microbit, and they have a Bluetooth low energy on there. Uh, and that was sort of the circuit that we sort of took and, and, and put on, on the batch here in combination with the heavy gaggle that we had from the previous year. Esme wrote a bootloader that could flash the, um, the Bluetooth uh, uh, Cortex-M0. Um, via the USB, the same controller, and so on. Um, there was no screen on this patch. Uh, you could add one yourself if you wanted to, but um, some people seems to, uh, that the, the, the very limited UI uh, might have been a sort of an, a hindering in, in making uh, quick hacks and, and getting something to blinking. Uh, these patches were assembled in China. That was the first ones we had where uh, we just got fully uh, assembled PCBs with surface mount components on there. It went very smooth. It was actually the PCB way that was uh, the sponsor for this batch. They, um, they actually contacted us uh, and said, okay, we can help uh, with, with doing that. And, and they actually did a great job. Uh, um, even in a somewhat limited time, they actually managed to get the batches uh, out to us in, 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 in good time. So we, the battery holders were soldered on by some volunteers at the camp, uh, very awesome. Um, but that was the only sort of post uh, receiving them production we had to do. And that was sort of a nice flow. Um, so the, the antenna for the Bluetooth actually goes up in the little antenna on the batch. Uh, it's just a, a, a tiny trace. Uh, and it seems to work fairly OK. I think some of the ponies guys had the communication between two tents and so on. So, uh, so that, was, that was fun. Same bootloader as the, uh, the one used for them for the previous uh, year. And then uh, last year, uh, the screen thing seems to be a, a topic people like. So we put a 20, two, two, uh, 240 by 240 pixel full color LED uh, uh, TFT IPS screen on it. Uh, it had a lot of pixels, so we also kind of had to put an SD card on because the little Happy Gecko has very little limited uh, memory. So if you want to actually have images on the screen, uh, you need to store them somewhere. Um, we kept with the same controller. Uh, and started experimenting with infrared communications to sort of have some batch-to-batch -batch communication. Uh, I needed to, uh, I should have looked more into that because it re worked really, really bad. Uh, it was like this much distance you could communicate on, uh, otherwise it, it wouldn't really sort of um, receive the data correctly. Um, these batches were also uh, assembled in China, but I kind of screwed up a few things, and those things had to be fixed when we uh, received the batches. So the production went actually pretty nicely, uh, but uh, the, the work afterwards was a lot of work. Uh, there was a whole group of volunteers, mostly from Holland and UK, uh, that did a great job in, in, in having this sweatshop on site uh, and fixing, uh, I think, a total of 400 batches. That was an awesome job there. Um, but ideally, we, we we shouldn't have that sort of things on site. Um, this was the batch um, shaped as the Yoda light, lightsaber in the Star Wars theme. Uh, all the uh, main uh, components are sort of hidden behind the screen. So now we're moving to, to this year's batch, um, taking some of the experiences from the previous batch productions and so on and, and, and how people use them in, uh, and, and trying to figure out, okay, what, what would be nice to have on a batch. Um, some things were like something that resembles a screen, uh, something you can see, something, uh, put text on it, put uh, graphics, uh, uh, put blinky stuff. Uh, that, would, that would be nice to have. Um, and also, right now, this uh, whole spring and summer, it's been a little... Uh, a little different, I guess, for most people. Um, and maybe trying to see if we can get some of that into the batch also. That would, that would be, be fun. Um, 
And the plan is to have as much as this batch machine produced uh, so that we, we don't have to have these switch jobs and, and, and doing a lot of assembly afterwards. Um, and then and having it really, really, really easy to <clears throat> get started with just jumping in, writing some code, uh, writing uh, that, that, that sort of process uh, should be as easy as, as possible to, to get as most people to, to hack on the batch and, and do their own uh, little designs and, and customize the batch to their own liking. Originally, we, uh, we went with uh, RISC-V processor and uh, we found this uh, GD32 VF103. It's a clone of, uh, or, uh, it's a variant of a clone they did of an ST chip in a factory in China. Um, and it, it looks pretty good. Um, you can get some dev kits from Seed Studio and I have also managed to actually get some chips, loose chips. Uh, it was via Taobao and Superbuy in China and it was a little hassle and, and it took a while. Um, but we actually managed to get a little dev kit and, and put something together and um, Esmuel had wrote a bunch of code to it and, and actually made it pretty neat. Uh, but getting these chips, when I called the factory and said, oh, uh, we need to get these chips and, and if they could help source them. And the answer was just no, they couldn't. So making a batch uh, and having a sample in China without being able to get the chip was a little too much for, uh, at least for me this year. <laughs> um, so we ended up doing a, a, a setup with a SAMD21. Um, it's a chip I've been playing a little with before, so and, and getting the chip is just like uh, asking DigiKey Digi or something similar to just ship it, and you have it two days later. That that's sort of a little easier to to get your hands on, and then um, we've gone with uh, Circuit Python on the chip because this chip is there's already sort of support for the Circuit Python on the chip. Uh, there are many other dev boards that already use this chip and Circuit Python. Um, the chip is very similar to the Happy Gecko. It has um, um, the same sort of USB interface built in, it has uh, crystal-less operation, so you don't need to eat external crystals, keeping the component, down, uh, component count down on the, on the batch a little bit. Um, the other sort of, oh, the main feature on this batch is uh, a lot of LEDs. So you can do either blinky or you can do text. You can use it as a screen. It's only like nine pixels by 32 pixels, um, which is of course a limitation, but that's sort of back to the demo scene thing uh, where having a, a, a limited scope, you, I think many of you will be able to do uh, awesome and, and very interesting stuff uh, with this setup. Um, all the LEDs are driven by two LED controllers. Uh, each of the LED controllers takes off half of the batch so 144 LEDs in, in, in one half of it and there are 144 in the other half. Um, they are controlled via I2C. They have two different addresses, so they're on the same bus. Um, but in the circuit Python code, you can have them as either two, dis you can have them at two, two displays and then you can sort of, with a frame buffer, you can do some little fiddly so it, it, it works as one large screen. These uh, little chips can actually store eight frames in the chip. Um, so you, if you have like a simple animation, you can have these eight frames stored and you do, just need to sort of flip the, the, which frame is displayed uh, and the chip will do that. So, uh, so that's, that's one way of, of offloading some of the load of the main processor if you want to do other weird stuff or infrared or something playing with that. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the next thing is take two on the infrared, uh, hopefully getting this to work on, on longer distance than these tiny little ones. Um, so we have an infrared LED that can emit signals. Um, that is this year driven by a transistor, so you can have the current going through the LED way higher. Uh, it's not that much higher, but it's, it's, it's more than what the pin on the controller can handle. And the receiver side is a complete module that has uh, ambient light compensation so that they will likely work both indoor and outdoor-ish. Um, and also it has the decoding of these uh, 38K signals that, that normally used with, uh, with inverts at uh, receivers and, and transmitters. So it, it should, they should also work with many little remotes that you have for TVs or whatever stuff you use IR for. And uh, similar to many of the, uh, the, the, the previous batches, we have this little gaming thing because I think on, on a screen this size, on a little handheld device, 
some sort of games, I guess, is, uh, is an obvious thing to put on there. Uh, I would really like to see Tetris, uh, it's a Tetris running on this curved display going down, and it could be a fun thing to, uh, to see that running. Uh, these are directly connected, so pins on the uh, microcontroller, so you can do uh, yeah, normal. It should be fairly easy to use. So, in, in, to to boost the uh, the flash that is on the microcontroller directly, uh, we've added a little four megabytes spy flash. Um, that's enough to keep a bunch of Circuit Python libraries. You can have maybe a little graphic files. Uh, uh, there's, on, on the batch right now, there's a little font, uh, bitmap font loaded on there also. Um, and it, it, when you plug the batch in, this four megabytes a spy flash will show up as your mass storage device, and that's where you save the files. Uh, that's also where the code.py file is, uh, is located. Of course, the four megabytes is small compared to the, uh, um, to the SD card sizes that you normally would use, um, but with the screen size on this batch, I don't think you will need, uh, like, gigabytes of flash storage. One other change we did this year is we went with a USB-C connector. I think many mobile phones and computers have sort of been moving towards that. Um, and these connectors have been sort of going down in price. This is a limited pin count connector, so we don't have the, the high-speed connections uh, that is used for USB 3 and so on. But the controller can't handle that in any way. Uh, but the SBU2, 1 and 2, that's the sideband use pins that are in the connector. Um, those are actually connected to the chip. So if you want to have like a batch-to-batch -batch wired communication, uh, a fully populated USB-C cable should be able to, to, to hook those two up. Um, so if you run like a UART, RX, TX stuff, um, if you get it mixed up, you can just flip the, the um, USB-C connect on one, of the, one end, and you can just uh, rotate it, and it should be uh, flipping the RX and TX, because SB1 and SBU is like symmetrical on the connector. Um, you can also power the batch, uh, similar to the previous years, on the, um, on the USB connector. Uh, it has a, um, a voltage regulator pulling the voltage down to 3.3 volts, and that the whole batch runs on that. The batteries, um, they... Um, they have a boost, so they boost the, the voltage up to 3.3, mostly because the SAMD, when running in the circuit Python setup, it has the brownout levels are fairly high, and when the LED sort of starts blinking a little, uh, they pull a bit of current, and then if we hit the brownout, um, the, the batch will just restart, and, and it, it won't go into uh, the normal run mode, it will go into the brownout mode, so you can fix your code, and then you can sort of go back in. Um, but if, if, if I just run the batteries directly in, you will hit that all the time. So this uh, voltage boost was uh, needed. And also, we added a, a physical switch. You can turn the batch on and off. It's only uh, turning the batteries on and off, so we have USB connected. It will always uh, be powered. Um, but the batteries, you can, you can disconnect with the switch. And it's sort of put a little bit inside, so you shouldn't sort of uh, dangle and, and accidentally turn it on. The batches come with a UF2 bootloader. That's the bootloader that is normally used along with CircuitPython. Um, if you double click the, or click twice on the, um, the reset uh, button when you have it connected to USB, it should show up as BH batch boot. Uh, and that's where you can drop in files uh, if you want to update your CircuitPython and so on. Or if you want to put other things on there, write C code or something like that. Um, CircuitPython. Um, is uh, preloaded on the batch. Uh, yeah, when, um, when you're in this mode, if you accidentally go into there, the little status LED next to the main controller, that will fade sort of slowly in and out. Uh, so if you see that, that's likely because you have clicked uh, reset a little too quickly or something. Circuit Python is Adafruit's uh, version of Python, and it's uh, sort of a modified MicroPython, sort of slightly deviated from the, the standard MicroPython. Um, it has a setup where when you um, edit a file and just say save uh, on the device, it will automatically reload the, the, the running program and run your code again, uh, which makes for a really quick sort of development, see what's going on cycle. So um, having this sort of software-like development setup is, uh, I think, is, is really neat for, for hardware, <coughs> hardware projects. Um, 
And it should help anybody also, especially people who haven't coded electronics before to get in and, and modify their, um, their, their batch a little bit on the software side. It's just, yeah, edit code pi and save the file and you will have a, a new text running on the, the little marquee thing. So there are some things that hasn't been done yet. It's uh, planned to be done, but it will be done sort of over time. It's not super critical for this event right now, uh, but the USB vendor IDs and, and product IDs, right now they're just sort of stolen from some other <laughs> project. Um, but to get them into CircuitPython and have CircuitPython sort of maintain, have the batch in there officially, they will need to be like official uh, vendor IDs. And, and I'll, I'll get that done eventually um, so that if, when it, when it gets up there and, and it's part of CircuitPython, uh, it'll, be, it'll be correct. Um, when you guys want to update your batch, you can just uh, get a new CircuitPython down there and it'll, it'll update. It all, all could be done via USB. You don't need a programmer for that. So the plan for this batch with like a lot of LEDs, um, that was to, um, to have it, it pick and placed. So it was like with with these many LEDs, you don't want to do it hand. I did the prototypes by hand because I didn't have a pick-and-place machine. And, and just placing the LEDs, not the other, all, all the other parts, just the LEDs takes 40 minutes. If you sort of, I think I know what I'm doing and, and had trips, but it's still 40 minutes for one batch. That's not fun. So if you start calculating out 40 minutes, you need the other components, that may be 20 minutes more. Then it's an hour per batch with 200 batches. Okay, that ends up being 200 hours. That's more than a month of work. Uh, that's not what time we have. <laughs> um, so the plan was to do uh, production in China. Um, that didn't really um, happen because stuff didn't work. Um, so the infrared stuff, the booting up where the, the batch sort of started resetting when the LED controller started up and so on, that's sort of uh, when we were supposed to start production, that was sort of the, what was happening. So. Backup solution ends up being that I have a friend with a picking place machine. That's a good friend to have, especially if he does picking uh, electronic projects. So um, I asked him, and he uh, he said that he, 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 he would be willing to help uh, out with uh, with populating all these batches and soldering them and so on. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about sort of how these picking place stuff. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was sort of thinking maybe I should have a ping place machine, but after actually using one uh, and doing a project like this, I'm not sure I want the ping place machine because they need to be babysitting. You need to be babysitting these machines. Um, and you actually, if you want to have something that does like fast production, you need like a really expensive machine. And if you have a really sp expensive machine, you would need to have a lot of stuff going through that machine. Otherwise, you wouldn't ever pay it back. So. Um, so uh, yeah, having your own ping and place machine, I don't think that's, uh, unless you really sort of need it, I don't think so. Um, the machine we used here had a, has four heads, so it can pick up four components at the same time, and then go in and place these components. Uh, so to optimize the, the speed of production, how fast these batches could be produced, because even with a ping and place machine, starting to calculate, okay, how many hours should this machine be running to assemble these batches? it ends up being like 20 hours and we don't like just have infinite time. So um, we spend uh, most of two days and a lot of two nights to, uh, to get these up and running. Um, but, but, but placing these uh, sort of, uh, which head places which components uh, in a somewhat uh, optimized way can, can help reduce the, uh, the, the time it takes to, to, to place the parts. Um, and also the feeders that the, the parts come in on, um, having those sort of placed in a, in a neat way, especially when we have these 288 LEDs that need to be placed and the other components are sort of low, low count. Uh, we actually had two feeders feeding these LEDs so that they could move quicker and pick them up and we didn't have to replace reels as often as we would if we've only one, one reel there. So let's see if it works. Yeah, so this is the machine picking up two parts in two reels, checking with the vision that the parts are actually on the feeders and then placing them on the batch. And then you see one head has this section, the next head has the next section. So the movement of the head is the minimal amount of movement that we could sort of uh, come up with. But getting to that point needs a little tweaking because 
which head is number one, how is the batch rotated and so on in the machine and all these little things. Um, that takes time and that's sort of the setup time of a pick and place machine, getting the feeders f f put on with the, the reels you have uh, you purchased and, and positioning the machine, telling the machine which sort of feeder is which component and, and, and where the nozzle, which nozzle should pick up in which feeder, all these little things is, is a planning process that if you send them to China, they will, they will handle that. Um, but if you want to optimize for cost or speed or something like that, then when you design your projects, having some of these things in mind might actually save you a bit of money or time, um, even if you don't do the production yourself. Um, the software for this machine is, uh, it's a Chinese machine. Most of this is actually in English, but the dialog boxes are usually in Chinese. So you kind of have to know what it means, or not by what they want, uh, because you can't read it. Not all of the, um, the process is automated. Uh, my friend doesn't have a, like an automated paste dispenser, for instance. So um, the first process in the PCB is putting the PCB in this little jig that I've put together, mostly with tape and 3D printed parts, and then um, squeegee on the paste. That's the little solder that holds all the components to the board. Um, getting this job right is kind of important because if you have them smudged and, and sort of touching each other, um, then you will have to fix stuff later on. And some of the batches, quite a lot of them, especially the small parts, the LED controllers, the, the solar paste got so close and, and, and smudged that most of the batches had to be fixed afterwards by hand. Um, another issue is that some of the LEDs, like the one in the corner up here, the, the machine put it on the side, so it, it doesn't really shine up. Uh, I think we catched most of them, but there might be a few that we've missed. Uh, but this manual step of looking through a microscope and, and checking all the, uh, all the parts that are on there and then adding the leftover parts, some like connectors and the, the, the controllers, they're all placed by hand by uh, me and my friend. So it was like a tedious job and it, it, it ended up taking at least uh, two days and most of the nights also. I put up all the files on the um, on the GitHub repo. I see already people have been doing uh, pull requests, uh, issues, and that's awesome. I'll uh, I'll get to them and, and look at it. And uh, you're very welcome to do pull requests if you have like an awesome project. You write some code that can go on there. Uh, very welcome to um, to do it and sharing it via this repo. Uh, I'll I'll try to be as quick as possible to to get it put put in there. Any questions? Yeah? Why not uh, uh, place LEDs for four feeders? So all, all the feeders are, are, are used to, to put the LEDs on there. Okay. Uh, so it picks up. Uh, it, you could put four feeders in there, but we also needed to. There was, we had a limited amount of eight millimeter feeders. So if you want to, so if you took an extra feeder for an LED, we would have to manually place a resistor instead. So it was sort of a, uh, yeah, weighing out uh, which sort of work. Uh, uh. And also halfway during this, uh, the nozzle free stopped uh, sucking up the, the air to, to pick up the components. So we had to sort of decommission feeder free, uh, the nozzle free, and then only having free uh, feeders. That changed the sort of, time to populate a board from six minutes to seven and a half minutes. So that's just, a, so, so even with the, the same parts, the same population, it, it, it's a 25% extra time to, just because the feeders are different. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, feel free to, uh, to sort of uh, ask me during camp. I'll be here all the time. Um, and I, I have a little mini electronics lab sitting down in one of the workshop rooms. So if, if one of you, want, if you want to sort of see in a little bit more, we can uh, maybe do a little session and, uh, and hang out down there. I have a little microscope also. We can inspect the PCBs, see if they are properly fixed. <laughs> cool.
I hope you guys have uh, fun with the batch and uh, do some interesting projects.